Child of the Dream, a memoir of 1963 by Sharon Robinson. Chapter one. Tomorrow is my birthday. I'm turning 13, which makes today, January 12th, 1963, the very last day of me not being a teenager. I stare at myself in the full length mirror attached to my closet door. I see dad's smile and mom's eyes and nose. The gap between my front teeth is distinctly mine. So is being nearsighted. I squint at the rest of my reflection. The way my body has started to curve, the way my skin breaks out around my forehead, there's a look of concern on my face. Honestly, I'm worried about tomorrow. My older brother, Jackie Jr., started to rebel once he became a teenager. I assume this will happen to me next. Maybe it already has. I shut the door to my walk-in closet and get dressed for the day in jeans and a t-shirt. It's best that I thoroughly enjoy these final hours before descending into teenage darkness, I think to myself. I decide to ride Diamond, my beautiful black and white horse with the white diamond shape on, her, on his back, dark black muzzle. He's my four-legged best friend. Together, we push boundaries and release the restlessness that's buried deep inside both of us. Riding Diamond is my definition of freedom. We're able to have a horse because our home sits on a hill overlooking a lake and is in the middle of six acres of land. My parents, Jack and Rachel Robinson, bought the property in Stamford to build this house in 1954 when my father was still playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Before that, we lived in an integrated neighborhood in St. Albans, Queens. I was four when we left there, just old enough to have a few memories but our Connecticut house is where I've spent most of my life. With all of that land, the only thing missing was a horse. We found the perfect spot for the brown barn and corral while it was being built. My younger brother, David, and I learned to care for Diamond at a boarding farm a few miles away. I dress for warmth and adventure and beat up riding jeans and two layers of shirts and sweaters. I leave my room, passing by my brother's rooms as I head down the hallway to the kitchen. Mom is standing at the stove, frying bacon. Usually, Dad would be standing beside her, stirring grits. But he's still in the hospital, recovering from knee surgery. Instead, my grandmother shifts between the grits on the stove and the fresh biscuits in the oven. Seeing them makes me anxious for an update on Dad. I can't hide my disappointment. I was expecting him to be home for my birthday. Morning, I say. Good morning, Sharon. Mom's smile is bright. You're just in time for breakfast. Please set the table and call your brothers. After putting five placemats, silverware, and paper napkins on the table, I skip back down the hall, tapping on my brother's doors and calling out to them. Jackie, David, breakfast. Then I turn around and walk back to the kitchen, slipping into a chair at the table. While I wait for the others, I plan my morning ride. Cascade is a winding country road with minimal traffic. Um, and no street lights or sidewalks. It curves up and down hills for a few miles and ends at a bridge over a waterfall, the perfect place for a morning ride. First, I'll head up Cascade to the dirt road where I can run Diamond and warm him up for a longer ride. I picture it in my head. Then I'll go check out the road along the reservoir. I wanna feel the breeze on my face and Diamond's strong body carrying me as we race down the street away. My thoughts were interrupted when David bounds into the kitchen and slides into the seat next to me. He's followed by a sleepy Jackie. At 10 and 16, my brothers are polar opposites. David's ability to make us laugh and his high energy are in sharp contrast to a sullen Jackie, who's a constant worry. I look up and smile at Jackie as he takes the seat across from me. We speak with nods. Besides Dad, there is another member of the family missing from breakfast. Willette Bailey lives with us during the week, helping mom with everything from cooking to watching over us. On weekends, Willette goes home to a section of New York City called Harlem. Sometimes we trail along with her. Willette's been with us so long, she's like a second mother to me. I know she hates missing my birthday party. I've got hockey practice at nine, David announces as mom places a platter of scrambled eggs and bacon next to a bowl of grits on the table. We pass the plate around taking large portions of both. Am I driving you over to Michael's house? Mom asks David. No, his dad is picking me up. I'll take care of Diamond, I offer, scooping hot grits onto my plate. 
He tossed me into the pond yesterday, David reports. That's the grumpy diamond. I hope his mood has changed. David said, that's the first time he's done that, or third time he's done that. Why don't you bring a bucket of water with you to the stables instead of taking Diamond down to the lake to drink, Mom suggests. Aw, Mom, that's no fun. Do as I say, please, Mom replies, then turns to me. It's below freezing. The dirt roads will be icy, Mom warns. Use the saddle. I nod, careful not to promise. I prefer to ride Diamond bareback, but I can give the saddle a try today. You won't catch me on that crazy horse, Jackie says, without lifting his eyes from the food on his plate. He's not crazy, I snap. Then you are for riding him without a saddle, Jackie says. You're the crazy one for hanging out in those pool halls late at night, I shoot back. Mom warns us with a stern look. Sorry, I say to my brother. I fork grits into my mouth, savoring the buttery taste and grainy texture. It's okay, sis, Jackie replies. How about a game of pool after dinner? You and me, I ask, surprised. Jackie has a little tolerance for bad pool players, has little tolerance for bad pool players, and believe me, I'm one of those. Why not? It's your birthday, right? Cool, I say, touched by his gesture and a bit suspicious. Why is he being so nice to me? Jackie, I want you to come to the hospital with us tomorrow so we can celebrate Sharon's birthday as a family, okay? Mom asks. Um, though it's not really a question. Jackie hasn't been to visit Dad since he went to the hospital two weeks ago. Jackie says nothing at first. He just stands up and glances briefly at our mother. I'm holding my breath. It's not a conscious thing. It just happens while I anxiously await Jackie's reply. Please, Jackie, please, I pray. My brother shakes his head. Can't, he says, walking away from the table. I have plans. Air escapes from my lips and I feel deflated, like a balloon. I watch Jackie leave and then I turn to face mom. There it is, I think. The look of disappointment on her face, I can't stand it. What are you doing today? I ask my mother, moving the conversation away from Jackie's rejection. I have to go on a few errands and visit your dad, mom says as she tries to recover. Grandma glances at mom as they exchange an, an adult worried look. How is he? She asks. His knee is infected. What? This is the first time I'm hearing of this complication. I start to panic. My heart races, but I stay glued to my seat. My dad means the world to me. For years, he was considered one of the best athletes on the planet. Tens of thousands of baseball fans would come from all over to cheer for him playing second base for the Brooklyn Dodgers. How could someone who was once so healthy be stuck in the hospital like this? It doesn't make sense to me. It happens sometimes, Mom says. Your father will have to stay in the hospital until it clears up. How long will that take, David asks. We have all have places to go, but no one moves. I grab hold of the table leg. At least another week, maybe two, Mom replies. I tear up thinking of my dad in some scary hospital room instead of home with us. David must have seen it too, because he jumps in with one of his funnies. I'll bring him my sword. I don't even know what that means, but we all laugh at the image of a little boy arriving at the, his father's hospital beside, bedside ready to save the day. Why'd you say that? I ask my brother when everyone stops chuckling. So he can protect himself from the doctors, David replies, like it's perfectly logical. David, what are you talking about? The doctors are helping your father get well, Mom reminds him. Tad was feeling good when he went to the hospital, and now he's sick. They must be doing something wrong. David says, slamming his knife down on the table. He stands up, drops his plate in the sink, and leaves the kitchen without another word. Your father will feel much better when he sees you tomorrow, Grandma tells me. We can save the birthday cake part until we're with Dad, I offer, ignoring the fact that he's not supposed to eat sugar because of his diabetes. Would a single slice of cake send his blood sugar soaring? Great idea, Sharon, Grandma agrees. I'm counting on you to help me make this cake. Soon as I get back from riding Diamond, I assure her while I gather up my plate and empty glass. Don't forget to clean Diamond's stall, Mom adds. I won't, I say, and drop my plate in the sink. Rachel, you go on. I'll get the dishes, Grandma offers when Mom heads to the sink. Thank you. Dinner six sharp, Mom calls to whoever's within earshot. What are we having? I ask halfway out the door. Steak, baked potato, and salad. Does that meet with your approval? 
Oh, yeah, I reply. It's Candy's favorite, too. If Diamond's my best animal friend, then Candy Allen is my best human friend. She lives a few miles from us and is the only other black girl in my school. Candy's sleeping over tonight so that when I wake up tomorrow on my birthday, she'll already be here. When it comes to steak, Candy thinks you have special powers, I say before rushing off to get ready for the barn. Chapter 2 I put on my coat and boots, then stroll down the hill to the stables. I love my diamond days, but my fingers are freezing before I reach him. I wrap the wool scarf around my face and shove my hands into my jacket pockets. Only my eyes peek over the scarf and they water in protest. Morning, Diamond, I say softly, stroking his forehead with my fingers. He snorts and shakes his head. It's cold, but we're going to have some fun anyway. Diamond's ears shoot forward. I clean his stall and replenish the food in his trough and then prepare him for our ride. This is my birthday weekend, so put on your best behavior, okay? Diamond nudges me with his nose. I'm trying to be quick. I stare into Diamond's eyes, daring him to be the first to blink. I give up and giggle. I'm not having a party. Dad's in the hospital. Nobody's in the mood for a bunch of girls running around the house. At least Candy's spending the night. We'll make milkshakes and listen to music. Oh yeah, Jackie said we can even play pool. I'm looking forward to it, even though I'm really worried about Dad. It helps me, talking to Diamond. I think of him as my horse, even though technically Diamond was given to my younger brother, David. Diamond came to live with us after our parents attended a dinner party in Greenwich, Connecticut, not far from our house in Stamford. The hostess told my mother about her son, who was now off at college, and how they were keeping his childhood horse out in pasture. The story of, his, of this boy and his horse made Mom think of her youngest son, and before the night was over, they worked out Diamond joining our family. I suppose Mom mentioned that I'd been researching horses for years and had volunteered at a petting farm near our house for several summers, but who knows? These mothers were talking about their boys, and truthfully, I don't care how Diamond came to live with us at 103 Cascade Road, just that he's ours now. I quickly figured out that this horse was a bit feisty, that trait, which most likely comes from Diamond's ears alone and ignored in the pasture, endeared him to, use us, to us even more. So we've spent the last six months trying to make Diamond feel loved. Some days he actually returns our devotion. I'm hoping today is going to be the one of those good days when the only thing I'll be feeling is the heart-pounding joy of the ride. I lift Diamond's hooves and clean out the dirt with a brush and metal prick. When I'm done, I put the brushes away and reward him with a carrot. Ready to ride? I slide in a, a, the bit into Diamond's mouth, past his teeth, and then lace the leather straps in, in front of and behind his ears. I check the saddle. It's frozen. No way am I using that. Am I sitting on that? It'll feel like a block of ice on my backside. I turn around the stall for something to warm up the saddle, but there's nothing around. Bareback it is, I say to Diamond. Shh, don't tell Mom. I lead him into the open air and vault onto his back. My right leg swings over his side and I take up the reins. We set off on an adventure. With minimal urging, Diamond shifts from a slow gait to a trot. My body rises and falls with his two-step. We head up the hill, then turn onto the dirt road. I scan the road for icy patches, seeing none. I ease up on the reins and let Diamond rip. In seconds, we're in full gallop, flying like a kite that's caught the breeze. The cold wind whips across my face, but I can barely feel it. I'm too happy. This is the way it's supposed to be. After pounding the road, steam pours out of Diamond's nostrils. Ready for the long stretch, I ask? Though it's not an actual question. Diamond doesn't really have a choice as I steer him up Cascade Road past North Stamford Congregational Church, where we go to Sunday school and church services, then down towards the road that runs along the reservoir. I've heard that at night, the road is pitch black and turns into a lover's lane. Kids from high school park and kiss in the dark. I can't even imagine the idea of being alone with a boy who isn't one of my brothers. Then I think about the crush I had on one of my brother's best friends, Bradley Gordon. But Bradley lives in New York City and only thinks of me as Jackie's baby sister. In the morning, this road remains deserted, so I can race Diamond with little fear of traffic. I make a clicking sound with my tongue and Diamond takes off again. 
it feels like the lift, like he lifts all four legs off the ground at the same time. It's a smooth, fast ride. I'm having a great time until Diamond stops abruptly. Did something scare him? Without hesitation, he whips around and takes off towards home. I'm no longer in charge of the ride. In fact, I can barely hold on. Oh, please. Oh, please. No, 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 no. I squeeze tight against his belly, praying I don't end up on the ground. In minutes, we reach the part of Cascade Road where mailboxes and driveways line the street. As we pass the first mailbox, my right leg scrapes against the metal, which tears my jeans and leaves a four-inch gash on the outside of my shin. I cry out in agony. Tears flow. I look down at my ripped jeans and see dots of, blood, of red blood seeping through the denim. Diamond presses on, oblivious of my fear and pain. I scream, watch out! But it's too late. A low-lying tree branch zaps me, and I fly off Diamond's back and land hard against the frozen ground just beside our property line. Luckily, I'm not hurt. I stand up and wipe the dirt from my jeans and the tears from my eyes. Today's not going as planned, I think, as I limp home. What were you thinking? I shout at myself. Mom told you not to do that. But would it have made a difference if I'd saddled him? I think. Uh, who knows? One thing is for sure. I cannot tell my mother about the long gash on my leg or the blow to my self-confidence. When I reach the corral, Diamond looks away from me. He's standing just outside the gate. I can't scold him because it's my fault, too. I lead him inside for grooming and look deep into his eyes. Diamond, I say, releasing a long, low sigh. We have a lot of work to do.